Hi. Good morning, Kerry Mercer. Welcome on VH Barrys. Thanks, Victor. Welcome to you. <laughs> Welcome to me. I'm, I'm extremely indeed. grateful. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Spring is springing and uh, yeah, feeling good. I've learned that uh, honeybees do not hibernate, which is a common point with you, Kerry Mercer, because you always have been very productive since 1984. It's a long time ago. I guess so, in in some way or another. I, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's true, but uh, we can come back to that if you want. Absolutely, and I would love to discuss about your latest release called The Bees. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Let's do the opposite and start with the most uh, focused thing I can say about The Bees, which is the image of The Bees. When I say The Bees in the song The Bees, which then becomes the namesake for the record The Bees. Um, so the song The Bees is about Melanie and I went on this bike trip. Uh, one thing that we love to do, like the, like kind of the thing, like music is not fun for me. Uh, art's not like a fun thing, especially writing is the least fun thing I can think of to do. I find it really uh, essentially unfun. Uh, and the thing that I quite like to do, uh, you know, so other people like to surf or... Uh, um, skateboard <laughs> i have no idea what people do anyways mel and i like to get on a bike melanie's my partner and also uh the drummer in the band uh and we like to get on our bicycles and we load our bicycles up with our tent and food and stuff and then we like to ride out of the city and to find a spot uh to uh spend the night and the nicest thing is if you can do this over and over again uh at about night seven you really start to uncoil and uh, I find for myself, I start to lose a lot of the, the kind of, I realize like, oh my God, it's not just like constant noise, it's constant fear. And uh, so that that's always behind it. It's fun to lose your fear for me. And I'm like, really enjoyed doing a, a ride. Anyways, um, so we went to, we'd picked this place uh, a couple of years ago and it was, I think it was Canada Day and there was no other place to go. So we're, I was like, I've always wanted to camp here because it, it's a place that's kind of connected to uh, places that I went with my parents as a child. It's called Jordan River, uh, which is a very uh, biblical name. Uh, it's on the west coast of Vancouver Island. It's quite a uh, interesting place because Vancouver Island itself kind of runs parallel to the continent of North America. So the bottom of it actually is facing the West Coast. And you can kind of like, it's a really salient moment when you kind of come around the bend and all of a sudden you're just facing the open ocean. And that's where Jordan River is. And uh, we kind of slept in this place. Jordan River is in a tsunami warning zone. So that's kind of like a bit unnerving, but that's pretty typical on the West Coast uh, at the low points. Uh, on the open ocean, when you're in the protected areas, like if you're on the kind of other side of an island, you don't have to worry so much about it. But uh, this was, you know, a, a place. So we kind of were like, okay, well, this is our destination. And then in the middle of it, we, we actually got the flu. Uh, and uh, there's this moment of like, I had to like, you know, barf or whatever and i was like oh man and you're exerting yourself physically and it's hot and it just is it's this kind of nightmare but you also have that floaty feeling when your consciousness is somehow separated from your body too which i think is a kind of a coping mechanism some little trick that your body does and in, in moments of extreme distress and uh, we went into this coffee shop. And so we'd been like riding in. We hadn't seen anyone. It seemed like especially wild. And we had to ascend this really steep hill. And, and you know, and your, your sweat is gray because you, you have this fever and flu. And I said, oh, there's a, like a little coffee shop there. A little 
coffee hut. And then we went into the coffee hut and then I opened the door expecting like cobwebs or, you know, or a very chill. And I opened the door and I was blasted with this really intense British techno music. And there's about 25 people in there. <laughs> it was essentially like a mid-afternoon rave. And the coffee barista guy was flipping <laughs> cops. And it just was like the worst nightmare. And I just had to kind of make my way through the gyrating, fleshy crowd into the washroom and just have a little meltdown. Uh, and I think there's a line that says, you know, I felt abysmal. I felt the rush. Uh uh, so anyways, yeah, so it's kind of a uh, travelogue in a sense. Um, so we're dealing with this, this illness and then we were riding through a field and all of a sudden there's fucking bees everywhere. So we had to do that thing, you know, where <laughs> you're swerving the bees. And I just was thinking, this is kind of a wild time. Yeah. And then we got to Jordan River and it was a day's journey. It, there was no, I no, um talk of like oh maybe we shouldn't this is a tsunami zone like this is kind of scary but like i said that's kind of typical but then i saw, saw other signs that was like you're also uh in a place if you just look up on the hill you can basically see there's this decrepit old dam that the bc government was like well we could replace it but we that would cost a lot of money so instead We'll have the safety plan, which is if these sirens go off, if there's an earthquake, because Vancouver Island is close to the, I don't know, the earthquake, the, the, the ring of fire, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if there, so an earthquake is very possible at any point. It could shake the earth. The dam would likely burst. And so you could actually find yourself in a position where there was like a torrent of mud and logs and old homes and, you know, cars and road chunks of asphalt coming, raining down on you and a tsunami coming in. But the government was like, oh, don't worry. Like you just get in your car and you drive away. And I was just like, well, what if you don't drive? Because I actually don't drive. I don't know how to drive. I never learned how to drive. I can't imagine myself like, I was kind of pumped in a way, like, oh, wow, I'd have to, like, we'd have to ride out of here, you know? And I was looking around. I'm not a very, um, not a very social person. Like, I have a really hard time striking up conversations with strangers. Is like, kind of nightmare fuel for me. But I was like, well, that person looks semi-okay. I guess if the sirens were going off, maybe they would let us jump in the back of their truck. But you don't know for sure, right? So we're just kind of lying there thinking, well, <laughs> I feel so sick and, you know, like deaf anyways. It's almost like bring it, <laughs> but not. And just, I don't know. I just wanted to put all of these experiences and images into a song. Uh, and that reminds me that, you know, something that actually we experience a lot in, in COVID that, the people whose job it is to create contingency plans, there is no contingency plan. If the contingency plan is get in your car or maybe wear a mask, I don't know. <laughs> in our province, they've stopped. Uh, just to relate it back to COVID, they don't even take, we don't count tests or cases anymore. The contingency plan, it's just kind of like, well, I don't know, you might die. Hopefully you don't. And that's the bees. That's the bees. And yeah. uh, Kerry Mercy, yeah. we can feel this relationship with nature also through the album cover mm. with someone riding a horse in front of a forest. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the album cover. The album uh, painting is by... Uh, a New York painter named Janice Nowins Nowinski. Janice Nowinski. Uh, someone, I just saw the image on the internet, actually, just randomly scrolling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I f like, you know, this thing called Instagram. I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, they're like a, a social media platform where you can follow. There's a new thing of people who just like are really excellent image collectors and have, you know, really excellent taste which is its own pitfall but uh 
uh, and they will broadcast images. Um, maybe it's the same for music. Maybe there's like high profile collectors that are like, they just shoot out, you know, uh, the, you know, JPEGs of the hot new song of, of a band that I like. And maybe their taste is really good. Anyways, because I, I, I like painting and I have a history of it. I follow some of these these people. And this image by Janice Nowinski came up. And I found it really striking. And it reminded me, it's much better, it's much more accomplished, but of the paintings that I used to produce for the covers of our records, which kind of um, coincided with a theme of the record, which is looking back and uh, I guess kind of uh, looking at your own legacy, your own history, your own body of work and digging in, uh, embracing it, I suppose. Um, and so I thought it was kind of a fitting image. I had thought about myself trying to learn painting again, but it's not the easiest thing <laughs> to learn you know i i always think about it i th haven't painted in 17 or 18 years probably and uh i often look back and think oh man you know it would be so difficult to get back to where i was uh, not that i was a great painter but actually you know it just looks like uh it might just look like a bunch of scrub but uh but it's not it's definitely not. Uh, so when I saw that image, I thought, oh, it'd be so nice if this person would allow us to use this image. And she did. Yeah. So hence the cover of the bees. Yeah. Kerry Mercer, you just mentioned two very powerful words, looking back, because if I understood correctly, one of the purposes of this uh, album called The Bees is to Physio philosophically invert time. What does that mean? That's a good question. What does it mean to philosophically <laughs> invert time? Uh, so I was reading a novel by a another uh, New York uh, culture producer, a novelist named Joni Murphy, um, whose work I quite like. Uh, and I was reading this book by her, a uh, novel called Ta Talking Animals, and there's just this brief section about how we always think that humans always conceive of time as something in the future. Uh, and it's a very, uh, anytime anyone says something about, you know, humans, the human experience, you have to be a bit dubious. Uh, and it made me really think, oh, well, you know, actually, that's right. You know, I do think of time as only, there's only one relation one orientation that I could possibly have with time, which is that the future exists in front of me, and the future is the thing that you got have to think, be thinking about, right? The the uh, the future is the thing that you want to divine meaning for, to plan for, to try and massage the future, to try and be at the right place at the right time, which I think is the backbone of like so much of this tech garbage and and kind of. Uh, capitalist profiteering of real estate is oh you 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 were there at the right place you know there is no right place or right time it seems completely rigged but the the enterprise of you know gaming the future of of uh, profiting from it by your own you know wise actions it seems actually really embedded in a lot of music practice and a lot of arts practice too and so this little passage talked about, oh, well, there are different cultures that like uh, envision the future as something that's kind of already happened. So uh, the thing that you are constantly considering is the past. And it really kind of struck me in terms of when you start to make a record, you really are future planning in, uh, in that traditional sense. You know, you're like, okay, so what? What uh, genres do I wish to explore? What sonic templates should I, you know, uh, try and kind of uh, walk towards? And um, what what trends are out there? I mean, I don't I don't know if I like would actually ever like verbalize that last sentence, but I think it is just implicit. There's this like famous Miles Davis quote about the. <sighs> You got to be doing what's 
in the future. Otherwise, you're uh, like as boring as a motherfucker in a museum. It's something like it's not the right <laughs> quote, but it's something like that. And I, I'm like, yeah, sure, but I'd rather be the motherfucker in the museum than the fucking Bluetooth guy in the glass condo, I guess. <laughs> Which is, you know, in in some senses, when we kind of over over uh, exert our our machinations and designs on the future, it just gets into this weird kind of neoliberal state, and I am pretty sick of it. So I just thought, you know what? I'm going to just go back into me because that's all I know is like that my trail. I can, I'm not saying that I can successfully invert time. That's like my ep- epistemological being is still, of course, future focus. It's really difficult to do. But I did actually try and like in my work. On Sunday night, often I'd be like, oh, my God, like, what is this work? What is this week going to entail? And I'm a mess. And I better, like, you know, even though I'm not even at work, I better, like, pull up my calendar and see what I've got going on. That'll certainly reduce my anxiety about the coming week and allow me to focus. And instead of doing that, I just actually started to just pull up. I didn't pull out anything up. I didn't need to. I just sat there and thought about the week that I just had. And it reminded me that pretty much every week is just the same anyways, you know, there might be a few different things, a few different meetings or, or whatnot, you know, but it's all, it's, the weeks are generally the same in our lives. They don't change that much. So at the end of each week, if you spend your kind of psychic energy, when you're pondering time, looking behind it, just, it actually, I felt it really uh, just kind of eased my anxiety, which was cool. Uh, and then I started to, I was like, well, that's cool. I mean, and when I started to write songs, I wanted the images of the songs. I wanted to load up the images with things from my past. Uh, whereas sometimes I think I had a lot of images of, I don't know, potential futures, you know? Uh, and so that really, the potential futures thing really gives a dystopic <laughs> tinge i guess to one's work uh and so i realized like you know i probably have 20 records of past digging in me still uh it was quite fruitful and and i just felt like i kind of just scratched the surface so uh stylistically i really just wanted to kind of return to forms that i felt really comfortable in because um, the forms that you feel really comfortable in are probably the ones that are you're made for those forms and those forms are made for you. And so I don't think a person should have to inhabit 10, 15 different forms uh, in their lives. It just seems like almost gluttonous. Uh, so for me to just be like, well, what is the space that I've occupied? And perhaps my future could actually be composed of the spaces that I've already occupied in a way that feels still feels fresh and righteous to me. And so uh, philosophically inverting time, for me, when I say that, that, that that's kind of what I mean is where have I been and what can I glean from that? And it turns out I feel like there's a lot I can glean from that. And Carrie Mercer... <gasps> with the collaboration of Spencer, Melanie, and Michael. You are, of course, giving a very fresh perspective and form, that word that you just mentioned, to those 10 original tracks. And I will even go further, uh, Carrie Mercer, and tell you that maybe that the bees are in the field of vision of the frogs and are therefore uh, part of their diet. <laughs> cool. cool. <laughs> I dig it. I like it. Uh, I just, I feel compelled to point out that the bees is actually me, Melanie, and Shyla. Um, well, those certainly spent the, 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 uh, the, the presence of Spencer and Michael is felt within the record because they contributed things, all of the players in Frog Eyes throughout the years, 
contribute a kind of a presence, an imprint, that when I was looking back and thinking about different songs, sometimes I would think, oh, this is kind of a Spencer era song, or this is a kind of, this is the kind of bass line that Mike might have played. Yeah. So um, you're. it's nice that you point out former members, but I just feel like I should say uh, that it actually is just the three of us, me, Melanie, and the keyboard player, Shyla, at this point. Uh, live, we're playing with this uh, wonderful guy named Paul Rigby, who uh, is a real, real gift to us, actually. He's just kind of a guy that lives down the street, as it happens. Uh, and yeah, so that's our, our live four-piece. Um, yeah. But I like that thing about, what did you say? The bees are in the field of the eyes of the frogs. And the frogs Absolutely. are looking to eat the bees. That's a kind of nice symbiotic relationship between artist and title. Cool. Absolutely. There is a relationship with uh, the name of the band, uh, Frog Eyes, and uh, the subject that are part of the angle of vision of those eyes in the nature because uh, frogs are uh, often uh, expected to meet some bees and to eat them. So they are part of their diets. <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah. Okay. I'm into it. That's uh, Victor, that endears you to me because that's the kind of thing my mom would say. Yeah, that is very much the kind of thing my mom would say. My mom's super cool, so you must be super cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah. um, you just uh, mentioned some very uh, wise word related to that peaceful feeling that I can feel right now with you. Um, because you're considering that uh, the past is the future. So do I exude a sense of peace now because I've made this time inversion? I'm not known as a person that exu exudes peace. I should say that. <laughs> I think I'm a person that exudes chaos and distress, not peace. But I don't know. Maybe it's uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe this inversion has uh, settled me down a bit. I don't know. Maybe that'll be bad. Maybe that'll be bad for my work. We'll see. Good so far, though. I think that this is really good, Kerry Mercy, because uh, you are obviously sometimes in a more chaotic mode because uh, you have a very busy style and very mm. uh, special way of singing. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, like I said, I, I exert and exude chaos and distress. Is that, that's how <laughs> I feel about myself. And even like the way I play, it's true. I've always thought of like Melanie and I, our relationship, speaking of inversions, I think traditionally the drums are the, you know, staccato, like the, the, I, I don't know music, so I shouldn't use a music word, but I think, I think, you know, it's like a big, busy field of of rhythm usually you know you have the stick on the ride symbol and that tends to fill up the space and then the melody would kind of weave itself in and out of the percussion i think that's how generally music is is approached i think with us because i'm so busy i have there's so many words and that pick on that string is going brrrr, and it, I cannot help it. I've tried a lot. But in the end, you choose the form or the form choose you, chooses you. That's part of the form is, is that melodic busyness or melodic instrument busyness. And for Mel, the drums, people have said, oh, melodic drumming. And I've always thought, what does that mean? And then I think the other day I was like, oh, that's what that means. For us, the drums kind of weave themselves out in and out melodically. And so like the relationship between the kick and the snare, the way they kind of insert themselves in between the notes that I'm playing. When Mel and I, we didn't consciously sit down and think, what's our style going to be? Who would do that? What the fuck, right? But um, when we started playing again, I think we realized, oh... That actually is us. Uh, and I guess sometimes, you know, it's the old cliche of you, you have to make a big journey before you realize you're 
just you went on a big roundabout and came back to the place where you started um some something like that um but i mean that form suits us i think that form really suits us and i don't know maybe the different records represent different tensions of you know i'm going to turn myself down to eight which means you can maybe turn yourself up to nine uh and different versions of that and i guess it depends on from song to song and piece to piece but i think for melanie and i that core tension is really that is how much am i playing versus how much is she playing and we're both unschooled i mean when mel was when she when we were writing drum parts at the beginning you know i would just be like go just boom 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 and she would be like oh you mean boom 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 and I was like, yeah, that's that's kind of, I mean, that's way better than actually what I mean, uh, you know. And so we would just go from there. It was pretty fun. Uh, we don't need to do that anymore because she just, you know, is able to write the parts in her own head. Uh, so we have this unschooled tension between ourselves. And then we always bounce that off against some people who actually have some musical theory, uh, which is satisfying. Uh, and if I don't have someone around me in the orbit, orbit, and maybe Mel feels the same, who doesn't have that musical, uh, theoretical background, we feel a bit like, I, <laughs> you know, it does. It sounds pretty hollow, actually. So it's quite nice. It's neat. Also, when people are like, like Paul, are the person who's playing bass with us, who's also like this you know, legendary guitar player and pedal steel player and mandolin player. He was kind of explaining to me like, oh, you know, when you just ride the bass like that, that creates a harmony. And it's like, I think I know what a harmony is. I think it's when a whole bunch of different parts come together. And for me, it's just like big, <laughs> big or little, uh, I guess is, you know, how I, how I would phrase it. But uh, again, what were we just talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. <laughs> and Carrie Mercer. Yeah. Inside this uh Carrie Mercer's orbit. Yeah. I can uh visualize and see multiple forms that took place during your career because you are part of a lot of different bands. Uh for example, Swan Lakes Blackout Beach Destroyer and even more recently a band called Soft Plastics. Sure. Yeah. Uh I mean, what else are you going to do with the time in your day? Uh I did I had you know I had like it's, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you might as well fill it up, right? Yeah. So, um yeah, I had I don't know. I don't, when you I, when people say career it's always like, "Oh, career. That's an interesting word." I know why I use it, but uh I like practice, I think, you know? Cuz career uh, I'm not sure if I have had an had a career, to be honest. I do know I've had a practice cuz I know I practice. I work every day at making something, so that's my practice and it builds up into like a body of work. But I don't know. I honestly don't know if career is the right word. Yeah. So I'm I'm not getting, you know, upset with you. I'm just freestyling thoughts based on what you've said. I think that's how a conversation works as, as far as I know. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, for sure. I, I guess I, I mean, not, there are other people who've, who have way more fingers and way m more pies than I do. And I think at some point I actually even felt like a bit like, I was dithering myself down or not really. I think I just wanted to be more focused and I wanted to like, there was a time when I was writing a lot and, uh, and, you know, I, like I said, I always kind of dream about going back to painting, but I also, I really love music. Like I love it so much, like the way that it just comes out, you know, it's, it's pressurized air. And it's floating at you and you can sit there, you can put a record on, you can close your eyes and you can just like trance out and let the kind of 
sonic sweep and the sound stage pour over and you could be like, whoa, the snare drum is just like right there. Oh yeah. And and you know, you can kind of figure out where the instruments exist on the sound stage. That's why I love stereo. What I mean by sound stage is like is the guitar on the left side or on the right side? And sometimes, like, when it's recorded well, or even if it's not, sometimes if it's, like, composed well, the parts just kind of shimmer there in the air. And they're not, you know? They're at the same time, they're completely not in the air. Uh, that's pretty fun. Uh, that's, you know, I, I really truly do love it. And part of pairing back, doing other things was, like, I give myself to the music, <laughs> you know, it was like a, uh, uh, like showing fealty to it, you know, showing a kind of, a uh, monogamous, uh, a love for it, I suppose is, was the ide- idea of not doing as much different stuff, but, um, yeah. So I don't know. I'm just freestyling thoughts about having a career and, working with lots of different people it's quite nice it's i love seeing like the other people that i've worked with or have connections to i love seeing them out in the world and them doing their thing i feel that kind of web of connection i guess is is quite nice um i love seeing like people i don't know just even people that i grew up with like still making music i feel a real affection and bond with them even if i didn't some people I'm like, I, you know, I remember like not even really liking that person when I was 21. Uh, and but now it's like, oh, yeah, OK, respect, you know, like that's so awesome that you're out there and and you also kind of swore that oath of fealty <laughs> to the sweetest art. Yeah. Carrie Mercer, I love the analogy that you just use by saying that uh, basically songs were just a pressured air. Well, it is. I mean, the, like, like sound is pressurized air, right? So I think it's I when I'm talking about pressurized air, I'm thinking about the kind of music lovers experience of actually sitting in front of it, uh, be it or standing in front of it as it exudes from a stage or exudes from the, you know, the listening room or the living room or in the headphones. It's pretty mystical, isn't it? It is very mystical. And I'm very curious, Kerry Mercer, about the next step for you or what I can call the the upcoming past if i follow your <laughs> philosophy are Indeed. you going to you're my first uh, devotee yeah yeah go on are yeah. you going to just kidding uh take those bees to make some honey oh uh well you know i mean i always work i always am writing songs so uh sometimes like this record just came out. We have to play, we get to, not have to, but we get to play a, a concert on this Friday. Uh, and actually, that's all we have because who can, I, I just, I can't plan anything in this uh, environment. It would uh, bankrupt me financially, psychically, and, uh, <laughs> you know, in all the ways that one, a person could bankrupt themselves. I think planning a uh, multi-date tour in this environment is just not good for me. So I apologize if you wanted to see us live. <laughs> We're getting much better. I think by the time that we are able to emerge back into the world fully as like a touring live act, I think it's going to be something else, you know, because I think every time we play and every time we make a record, we become more confident in that form that we've chosen or that form that's chosen us and at some point we might even become masters of that form which is pretty neat and i feel like actually honestly we're headed in at least the right direction famous last words but (laughs) you know so uh to answer your question of what's next well i did say you know to you that uh it feels like i could sit here and 
think thinking of the past as the future, uh, I could make 20 records, you know? I mean, I'm, yeah, yeah, or not. I don't know. I mean, at the end of each record, you have an opportunity to pause your practice and ask yourself, honestly, you know, is this something I still want to do? Which is quite nice because when you keep doing it, you're like, I even asked myself that question and lo and behold, I'm still doing it. So I don't know. I just, I have like right now I have like seven new songs, which feels like the shape of a new record. I don't know what to do with them. They're just sitting. In fact, I forgot how to, I forgot one of them. I have six that I know. I know I had seven because I have a little like, you know, (laughs) (laughs) and so, you know, when you forget something, Right? The harder you try and remember it, the more it's pushed out of the back of your head. Have you ever had that? It's like if you're trying to remember a word and someone walks up and they say, oh, is it arduous? And you're like, no, but now, thanks, all I can think of is arduous. So I can't get too stressed out about it. But, because I think someday I'll wake up and be like, oh, that's that song. Right, 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 right. It goes, eh, eh, eh. yeah, because that's kind of how it works. But, um, it, yeah, it's just, it's just, That's how I work, you know, work a lot, practice a lot, play a lot, coax the songs out of the guitar, write some words that make sense that you feel good about, uh, you know, work on the words so you feel really good about them. And then, I don't know, you know, go do something with them, with some other people. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's like if you could, the analogy that I use is like, If you could build your own wave and then go out and surf it, and at first you didn't know quite the shape of the wave, you knew there was going to be a wave, but you didn't know if it was going to be a big wave or a medium wave, or if it was going to be a forceful wave or like a chill wave, Uh, (laughs) you know, and you put enough songs together though, and they kind of create this cohesive, forceful, you know, energetic thing that that at a certain point, you, the creator, feel like you can ride it you know it's i mean you can see why it's the thing i would want to do right that's pretty cool yeah you're definitely heading to the right direction kerry mercer thank you very much yeah thank you victor nice to talk to you